So how do you know that God will hear you in your time of trouble? I'm sure we have all experienced it, believer and unbeliever alike usually, that when the bottom falls out and everything is against us, we have this impulse to cry to God for help, uh, even oftentimes for those who don't believe in him. Uh, when the worst things happen and the bottom falls out, uh, they call upon God whom they may or may not know. But how do we know that he will answer us, at least answer us in the affirmative? How do we know that he's going to come help us? Well, our text this morning really puts that question and answer before us. Um, and while hopefully by the end it is comforting, it's not immediately obvious as to why it would be. Uh, we encounter a song this morning that is sung by David, uh, the famous psalmist. Uh, in the day, we are told in verse 1, that he was delivered from the hand of all of his enemies and from Saul. And so our context, at least the immediate context of the song, is the demise of Saul uh, and most likely his death. And David cries out to God and sings this song saying that he has finally triumphed over this enemy, if you know the story, who pursued David for what felt like countless years. Had David hiding with his men in the rocks, had him always on the run. There was somewhat this guerrilla warfare aspect to his whole life, as long as this king was alive, for David had sworn that he would do no harm to the Lord's anointed. And yet, eventually, Saul meets his demise. And David rejoices that God has been faithful to answer his prayers. Well, what is interesting about the song, uh, at least as we find it in 2 Samuel, is that it is not printed when it was sung. So if David sings this song or uh, says it to God on the day that he's delivered from Saul, it's not printed in the book of Samuel to the very end long after Saul has left the pages of the story. For some reason, uh, our narrator, the one who put the book together, saved it for the you know, tail end of the book of Samuel instead of inserting it in the actual action when Saul passes from the scene. And we'll see that there's some reasons for that. It is interesting, the book of Samuel that will begin in the fall really is one book. We have it as first and second Samuel, but it's one long book, so we've helped ourselves by breaking it up. Uh, but it begins... Most interestingly, with the song, the song of Hannah. And Samuel ends his book, or nearly ends it, with another song, this song of David's deliverance. And David's song really answers the plea of Hannah. The song that she sings is answered by the song that David sings. She cries out at the end of her song. She says, give strength to your king and exalt your Messiah or your anointed one. Our song ends, you'll notice, great salvation he brings to his king and he shows faithfulness to his anointed one. So she cries out, establish a king and be faithful to him. And it ends by saying, you have established your king. You have been faithful to him. You've done everything that you promised long ago to Hannah in her song. It is interesting to note that this song that we have read will, uh, is also found in the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalm 18 is word for word, nearly word for word. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Um, but in the book of Psalms, you'll notice it answers Psalm chapter 2. So in Samuel, it's the, the answer to Hannah's song. In the Psalms, it's the answer to Psalm 2, that first royal song where God says, uh, Beware, kiss God's anointed one, lest he be angry with you. And it also says that he's going to have all the nations bowing down to his king. And then in Psalm 18, we have the nations bowing down to God's king. It's this uh, capstone, again, uh, of these royal psalms. So it's used, it's repeated again twice in Scripture. It must be pretty important, the fact that God would use uh, two uh, pretty lengthy sections of Scripture to repeat word for word this particular song for us. So what is it about? Well, I want us to follow the song by using... Uh, if you will, the spatial imagery that's used and that there's a lot of up and down in this song, and that may seem weird to us, uh, but it's poetically helpful uh, and it's also helpful structurally. Uh, and so the first thing we want to see is a king going down. We find David in our song this morning uh, in what appears to be utter despair. 
Uh, at least that's the situation he had found himself in prior to his deliverance. He is threatened by loss and in a state of weakness. But in the song, he, he tells us that. He tells us about his plight by putting it in words uh, where he's always directionally just going further and further down. So we're told that he's saved from his enemies, but what enemies? You'll notice in verses 5 and 6, the waves of death surrounded me. You know, uh, if you've been in the ocean and you've ever gotten stuck out there uh, between sets and you come up for air and then there's another wave waiting for you, you know this feeling uh, where time after time as you're coming up to breathe, you're being overwhelmed again by these great forces. David says, that's what my life was like. Uh, my enemies were coming against me and these enemies are all given these watery sort of descriptions. Uh, there are these waves that are rolling over him. And then we are told, uh, you know, there's these torrents of destruction that attacked me, these kind of flash floods coming out of nowhere, just toppling me over. And we get these two watery images that by the end of this series, you will not only be familiar with, you may be tired of, uh, but it's an image that the scripture uses over and over and over again. And at least you'll know how to read your Bible when you come to them. So when you read the book of Revelation and you see things like there is no more sea, you'll realize why that's good news because this can't happen to you, right? The waves can't roll over you and the torrents can't drown you. But you'll notice that these waves and this water are all symbols symbolizing the threat of death, as he says, the cords of shale wrapped around me. And shale is that Old Testament picture of the common grave. He's basically saying, you know, the grave was reaching up with these, uh, with these ropes and it was pulling me down into it. And then he says, you know, this hunting trap of death was about to swallow me. And so again, every image is him going downward. You know, you drown, you're getting pressed under the water. But as he goes into the water, he's saying death is reaching up and trying to bring him further and further down. Well, we know the historical setting. Uh, David was never in danger of drowning that we are aware of anyway. Uh, so this isn't literal water. That's what's so beautiful about these songs and the poetry that they give to us. Rather, David looks at this period of time when he's being hunted down by Saul and he's on the run and he uses these images of chaotic water to describe that period in his life. And that shouldn't surprise us because the words that he gives us are the same words, again, that describe things like the flood or the waters of the Exodus. He's talking about times of chaos where death is approaching and God's people and God's plan are under attack so that they're going to be undone. So he uses this image to say that there's this chaos introduced to my life that wants to undo the promise and the plan of God. And so I'm calling out for help. Death is knocking. And so you'll notice Saul in this song is on the side of death and hell and against the promise of God's king. And again, notice all this imagery is downward. So David needs help. So where does he look? You'll notice he calls out to him who is above. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, he says. To my God, I called. And from his temple, he heard the voice of my cry as it came to his ear. Now, remember, uh, David's singing this song before the temple's built. So he's not talking about the Solomonic temple. He's talking about God's throne room in heaven. He says, as I'm approaching death and as it's trying to swallow me up, I called out and God heard from his temple high above. And so if we have a king going down, you'll notice what we see next in our text is a God who bends down. We see this next beautiful thing take place. We have God who is great in strength. He's been described to us in verses two to four. You know, all of these attributes heaped on top of each other. He's a stronghold. He's a refuge. He's a savior. He's a fortress. He's a rock. And so notice this one who's on the run, uh, this future king who at this point has no fortress, says, you know, God is my castle. He's my stronghold. He protects me, right? If you hide inside your fortress, those things are with, uh, with, uh, those things that are without can't breach easily those walls. 
You know, these rocks that he's hiding in all over the Judean wilderness, he says, God's my actual rock. I hide in him and he protects me from those things that would attack me. He is my shield and my horn. And so over and over again, he heaps upon God these symbols of strength. And he says, I want to hide in him. And so I called out to him and notice the God who has all that strength uses it to save. That's what he says, at least in those first four verses. You know, he's my rock, my refuge, my strength, my salvation, my salvation, my salvation. And we hear those words, right? We talk about salvation and it gets real spiritual, right? Where God snags out our invisible soul and he scrubs it clean. Uh, When David's saying it, he's saying like, there's someone hunting me down and wants to kill me and I need you to rescue me. That that's the kind of salvation that God is. And that is actually the way the Bible uses it concerning us. That we had enemies that were seeking to destroy us. We were being hunted down. And God delivered us. He rescued us from those enemies. In verses 8 to 20, you'll notice this cry that goes up from David as he's going down to death meets the ear of God. And it's interesting that what God's response is. It says God gets angry. He gets angry for David. And it says then he bends the heavens and comes down. You know, the language that's used in the poetry there, uh, you know, maybe you've heard it, you know, he rends the heavens maybe in your King James Version, that the heavens are looked at as a curtain that's draped above us. And it says God rips them open and he descends in all of his power to come save and deliver his chosen one. I mean, listen to the imagery. It really is beautiful. That when God hears the cry of his beloved and he understands that someone's messing with the one that, he is, that is dear to him, he gets so angry that he rips heaven. It says he rides on a cherub, right? Uh, this aren't um, the uh, precious moments, angels that you're used to. Uh, God's not riding some chubby little baby in diapers. Uh, we get to see the picture in, in the Bible of angels, the, these kind of fearsome, almost, you know, if you, if you read the language, dragon-like creatures, right? Smoke and snorting coming out of their nostrils. He's riding the wings of the wind. God is descending on this kind of mighty chariot, throwing thunderbolts before him, uh, bringing destruction in his wake, and he's covered in the text, in darkness. And as he sends forth these arrows of lightning, the enemies scatter. And the language they're used in verses 8 to 20, the whole creation reels at his coming. You know, it says, you know, the seas peel back. They don't know what to do. They start to show the pillars of the ocean and the foundations of the earth are laid bare. The cosmos, the whole world, the whole creation is shuddering at the coming of God. And he's coming at the cry of the one that he loves. All of his power is at work for David. But you'll notice he still can't be taken in by the human gaze. That's what's so interesting about the way that this is framed. Notice there's this dark cloud beneath him, and then it says that there's darkness that envelops him. This is what theologians refer to as the hiddenness of God, that God can't be seen in this text. He's hidden from the eyes even of David here. Even as he's revealed here as a God who comes to save, he's hidden from us. We can't behold him. He's other. He's holy. He's too much for us to take in. And then you have to love the description of this salvation in verses 17 and following. He sent from on high and he drew me in. So if David's sinking and God's coming down, notice God sends basically a cord down and he begins to draw David back up to the surface. Literally, uh, most woodenly, it says he Moses me in. Moses' name is based on this word, right? Uh, when Moses is found there uh, by Pharaoh's daughter and she draws him in from the water, that's how he gets his name. He was drawn in from safety out of the water and given life. 
And David says, God came down and he moses me out of the water. He drew me in. And he set me, you'll notice, in a roomy place. It really is a, a beautiful image, especially if you've been on the run and in hiding and pressed about with worries or worse, drowning in deep waters. He's not hemmed in, he's not suffocating, but he's in this stable, roomy place where he's allowed to roam and uh, do so without care or worry that anything's going to approach from the outside and endanger him. He's been placed in this stable situation that's a place of rest. And so we have a king going down and a God who bends down, and then it finishes our song with a God who is a king who is raised up. You'll notice from being in jeopardy and fleeing right after the deliverance, from verses 30 on, you see this progression of David's victory. David starts to, if you will, let us march along with him as he just begins to conquer enemy after enemy after enemy until at the end, he says, all the nations worship me. Every enemy out there cringes before me. So he is in this place of great despair. God comes down and delivers him. He says, from that moment forward, I just slowly and incrementally began to conquer until all the nations bowed at my feet. Listen to the language. He brought down people under me. I stand above those who rose against me. Notice again, the spatial imagery. Here he was sinking to the bottom. He says, now God has exalted me. He's raised me above those who sought to bring me down. He's brought people under me who sought to exalt themselves above me. Verse 44, he kept me as the head of the nations. 45, foreigners came cringing to me. 46, they lost heart and they came trembling from their fortresses. We move from David sinking down to God coming down to ultimately David raised up and every other nation bowing down before him. And he praises God for it. But then we have this weird turn in the middle of the, the song, which really is the center of this particular poem. He explains exactly why God acted for him. In verse 20, he says, he did it because he delighted in me. And we think, well, that's good. But then he tells us in verse 21 and following why God delighted him. And so to answer that question, why does God hear our prayers? Or how could we know that God is surely going to come to our aid when we call to him for help? Well, David gives his answer here. Look at verse 21. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him. I kept myself from guilt, and the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. I mean, after all the faithfulness of God language, the song turns to David, and he says, God favored me because I followed him because I did what I was supposed to do. Maybe that sounds odd to us. When we sing the Psalms, these kind of things strike our ear funny, don't they? When we say things like, you know, do good to me because I have done what is right, we think, yeah, you know, I can't sing that with as much confidence as I'd like to. But it's the placement of this song that makes it even more odd. It's odd for David to sing this, but it wouldn't be as odd if he was singing it or if it was placed at the actual time of the events when Saul was finally conquered and David was given peace. Because while David was a sinner, he wasn't as bad as we were going to find out that he's going to become. But by the narrator putting it at the very end of the book of Samuel, we know David's whole dirty story. 
which makes these verses pretty hard to take. I mean, you know, you spied out a woman from your rooftop and as the most powerful man in the nation called for her to come over while her husband was out fighting for war. You committed adultery with her, impregnated her, and then to cover your tracks, you brought her husband home in hopes that he would sleep with her. And because he was too noble to do so, you sent him back out to war and put him in the most dangerous place so that he would get killed, so that you would never be found out for what you'd done. And that doesn't even begin to get into the story of Absalom and all that happens in that treacherous ordeal. But David's life, if you look at it, it's real hard to read these verses and to take them seriously. It's so hard that many have said, well, David didn't write this song. I mean, that's how we solve it. Uh, Someone else wrote it that we don't know. Therefore, we can't find out what's wrong with him. Um, One author writes, for David to make such a claim is odd and incongruous because Israel knows better, meaning everybody knows David's story. How can Israel sing this song with a straight face knowing that it's coming from the pen of David? But here it is, in the mouth of David, twice in Holy Scripture. So what do we do with it? And how is it of any help to us? I mean, if God answers our prayers because we can declare that we're good, uh, that might hinder my prayer life. I'm not sure about yours. But uh, the conclusion is this, that God still bends down. You see, you can't fully understand this song until we see how it's ultimately fulfilled. This cannot, as it stands, fully be speaking about David. And in one sense, even David knows that. I mean, when did David really have all of the nations bowing before him anyway? When was he ever exalted in this manner where every nation came cringing before him during his reign? I mean, he had some military success, but nothing to this extent. Now, even the song itself tells us that David's looking for something at the end, that it doesn't end with his reign, that it's this promise to David and to his descendants. And so in one sense, David is speaking prophetically. He's singing this song with a certain amount of faith and hope that the God who came and delivered him from Saul would also raise up a son who would outstrip his father as far as holiness and obedience and righteousness in Israel was concerned. And because that's true, because David is singing beyond himself, David can sing this song and mean it, every word of it. And you can sing this song and mean it. Every single word, even the uncomfortable parts. Well, how? notice Paul is quoting this psalm in Romans chapter 15. When he's talking about what it means for us now in the New Testament as Gentiles who have come to bow the knee to Jesus, he says, well, this is exactly what God said would happen. And then he quotes 2 Samuel 22 or Psalm 18 and says, I will sing of your name among the Gentiles. I will praise you and so forth. Without flinching, Paul puts Jesus standing in for David as the king singing this song. He puts these words in the mouth of our Lord and says, that's whose song this ultimately is. It wasn't David. It was David's greater son. It's only Jesus who could say with a straight face, you know why God delivered me? Because I was righteous, because my hands were clean, because everything that he wanted me to do, I did it. All that was written, I kept every single one of his ways. I never departed from his rules. I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, according to my cleanness, come and deliver me. And that is exactly what the Bible teaches us. It is Jesus who is ultimately surrounded by these enemies. It was Jesus whom the waters of death came and overwhelmed. It was Jesus whom all the powers of hell themselves gathered against, who was drowning in the midst of this sort of warfare. 
It's Jesus who sank down even to death and to hell and was rescued by God. And the Bible tells us exactly why he was rescued. It says the grave couldn't hold him because he was righteous. Because there was nothing there to keep him down. Because he had done everything he was supposed to do, God vindicated him before the watching world that he would not let death have the last word over his son. And from that day on, Jesus' victory has spread just like this song. Right? It's after David claims his righteousness that his march toward victory begins and all the nations bow to him by the end. And it's at the resurrection of our Lord that, interestingly enough, all the nations start to come in from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, claiming Jesus Christ as king from every tribe and tongue and nation and kindred. And while that is absolutely true, and hopefully you find it beautiful, it doesn't mean much to us if it isn't for us, meaning this song. The song he sings does become our song, though. Not just because of what it reveals about him as the true king, but because of what it reveals about God. What it tells us about that one who's a rock and a refuge and one who saves, one who comes on the wings of the wind, riding the clouds and throwing down lightning. You see, the God of this song comes in this song in power to deliver. But because he does so, he's hidden from our eyes. We can't see him in all of that power. We can't bear the sight of it. He comes wrapped in darkness and cloud. He is the hidden God. But notice, in the coming of Christ, we not only see the revealing of the true King David, we see the full revelation of the true God. We finally get to behold God, not wrapped in darkness, but shown forth in the glorious light of his own Son. Notice he comes as he rends the curtains of heaven, he comes down not wrapped in darkness, but wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. I mean, what an odd way for God to display his power. This God wrapped in human flesh and the person of Christ says that if you have seen him, you have seen the Father. That if you want to behold God's power, if you want to behold all of his might to save you won't behold it in the thunder and the lightning. You won't behold it in the whirlwind. You will behold it on the cross. God says, that is my power. Made perfect in true weakness. This is what it takes to save. This God comes in all of his might to rescue. And you'll notice he does so by laying down his arms or as Dylan would say, by burying his guns in the ground, by drowning in the waters himself until ultimately he is buried in the ground for three days. That is the power of God. That is the saving action of Yahweh. It's far more powerful than what we behold in the whirlwind. It is God made known to us. And because he was made known to us in this way, we can sing. We can sing this song in the first person and not with a wink, but we can actually mean it. I mean, are you in trouble? You know, do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel like there are things that are just too much for you? Well, according to this song, you can cry out to God and be sure he'll answer because you're righteous, because you're blameless in his sight, because you've kept his ways perfectly, and therefore he is pleased to answer your cry. And you've done all of that because your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You and David and I stand blameless because God came down in power and laid down his life for his friends. And as he was raised in newness of life as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, he becomes our life, that God the Father views you through the lens of his Son. And it's not a faux righteousness. 
He really views you as perfect. You can call on his name through the name of Jesus and be sure that he will answer you with favor. And not because you personally have done so much to win him over, but because your king has come and fought for you. And he has obeyed perfectly on your behalf. You see, God is a shield, our song tells us, to all who will take refuge in him. He protects anyone who will hide in him. And so you'll notice he comes hidden in human flesh that we could hide ourselves in God through Christ completely. To where all that God sees when he sees you is himself through his son. When he sees you, he does see Jesus, and he is well pleased. So that when you call on his name, he is zealous, he is angry to come to your aid. How can you know that's true? Because he's already rent the heavens and come down in human flesh for you. May that be your hope this morning. Let's pray.